So, what's what's with the tenders? Why um, why got those? What what's that for? What's it for? Tell me. Well, most people in the know know what a tender is. It's one of the most basic elements of the vast majority of steam locomotives. But they're, um, uh, uh, again, a surprisingly deep topic and aren't always used on steam locomotives either, believe it or not. Tender's actually a pretty vague term, but in general, it refers to a very special rail vehicle that's usually hauled by a steam locomotive, and it's there to contain the engine's fuel and water supply. See, in a lot of steam locomotives, particularly of the classic design, um, there's really no space to put coal, wood, or whatever fuel they're using, as well as the water, in the engine itself. You need to put that somewhere else, if you want to go very far anyway. Thus, tenders were attached in the back, and they're effectively just another car, but they're coupled semi-permanently to the engine. It is possible to detach them, and you can swap tenders out in some cases, depending on a lot of different factors, but for the most part, locomotives kept their tenders for almost their entire lives. They were just as much a part of the engine as, well, the rest of it, even though, technically, they were a separate car. Now, tank engines, like Thomas, don't have tenders, and the reason is in the name. Tank. They have tanks and bunkers to hold their fuel and water. They're designed not to need tenders, and this is because the tenders take up extra space and make it a bit more difficult to go backwards in a lot of cases. For this reason, tank engines are generally used for things like yard work, where you would want a smaller locomotive that takes up less room, as well as one that can go backwards a lot more easily. But regular, classic-style locomotives usually had tenders, especially for mainline work, and that's simply because they could go farther. They could have more fuel and more water. And most things involving the tender was the fireman's department. He was responsible for giving the locomotive fuel and maintaining the water supply. Generally, there were multiple different stops along the line, so the water could be replenished. Since even with a tender, you want to top that off to make sure you don't run out. Otherwise, you might explode, and that's really bad. But tenders go well beyond simply carrying fuel and water. There are multiple different kinds of tenders, in fact, not just the classic coal and water design. In some areas, like here in America, people sometimes call them coal cars. And, um... Okay, look, I've never heard them called that, and I say that as an American. And also, I hate that. Uh, don't call them coal cars. That's, um, that is much more inaccurate. Just, just call them tenders. It, it's, it's, it's much, much better, in my opinion. Now, a significant portion of tenders were generally of a rectangular shape and varied quite a bit in size. But for the most part, they all did the same thing. But there were a few more special tenders that were a bit more distinctive or offered different benefits. And one of the more advanced ones were condensing tenders. Condensing steam locomotives were designed to recycle exhaust steam by condensing it into feed water. This allowed them to conserve water, of course, and it actually improved thermal efficiency. And there were condensing tenders that were designed to do this, but the problem with them was that the maintenance costs tended to overshadow the benefits that they provided. A lot of them would wind up being converted to just regular old tenders later, simply because it was too annoying to manage them. It wasn't financially reasonable, as much as it may have made sense on paper. But in terms of regular old tenders, they actually have their own weird designs too. The Vanderbilt, for example, is one of the most distinctive, since it almost doesn't look like a tender at first glance. It looks like a tank car, and that's true. In 1901, it was patented by Cornelius Vanderbilt III, who was, in fact, the great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt III's tender had a cylindrical body like a tank car, with a fuel bunker set in the front end. It could be used for oil burning or coal burning, and the benefits of this design was that they were stronger, lighter, and actually held more fuel in relation to surface area than traditional square tenders did. A lot of railroads all over the world would wind up utilizing a version of this particular tender. There's whalebacks, which are called because they're, well, rounded, but only halfway. It's sometimes called a turtleback or a loaf, you know, like bread. 
And these were pretty much exclusive to oil-burning locomotives. The front held oil and the back held water. The Southern Pacific really liked these, and a lot of their locomotives utilized them. There were slope backs, which, judging by the name, are tenders with sloped backs. These were generally utilized for tender engines that were designed to be switchers. And I know I just said, well, didn't tank engines do that? And yes, yes they did. However, here in America, we didn't like tank engines quite as much as, say, the UK, who just loved their tank engines. We had a lot of really small, teeny, tiny, tender engines that were utilized in the yards. And even though they had tenders, they were still small enough to be manageable. The slope back was meant to allow the engineer to see behind the tender more easily, thus allowing a tender engine to be able to do yard duties without having difficulty going in reverse. While this did mean that this particular tender design couldn't contain as much fuel and water, they were meant to work in the yard, where there was a lot of fuel and water. Really, they had just as much stamina as a tank engine would, if not more in some cases. So, yeah, this was quite effective in that specific role. There were corridor tenders, and these were mostly associated with the London and Northeastern Railway over in the UK. For the introduction of the Flying Scotsman service, on May 1st, 1928, not the locomotive necessarily, this was an express passenger train service, the LNER made 10 special tenders constructed with corridors. This meant that people in the passenger coaches could actually walk through the tender and into the locomotive, or vice versa. The passage ran along the right-hand side of the tender and was five feet high and 18 inches wide. So, not exactly the largest corridor in the sense, but I could probably squeeze through there personally. Don't know about the rest of you. There were water carts, which is a special tender that's designed to be high capacity. It was used by the London and Southwestern Railway over in England. These tenders had a double bogey design with inside bearings, giving it a pretty distinctive appearance and were pretty big for their time. And there were also canteens. Now, canteens are tenders but they're additional tenders behind a regular tender. Sometimes they're called auxiliary tenders. Now, why, um, why are there two tenders now? What is that for? Well, the name canteen refers to the fact that they only carry water, since obviously you can't put coal in the tender behind another tender. How are you going to get to it? Interestingly, during the Steam Age, canteens weren't used very often, and this is because the railways were designed around the idea of using steam locomotives. That meant there were a lot of water stops already on the lines. There was no reason to carry extra. The only major exception was the Norfolk and Western, who liked using canteens on their really, really big locomotives, like the Y and the A class, for their long coal drags, time freights, fast freights, as well as merchandise freights. The reason for this is that the canteens meant that they could skip one of the water stops, particularly in mountainous terrain, and that meant that the locomotives, as powerful as they were, didn't have to try getting up hills with really heavy trains from a dead stop. You could see how it was beneficial for them to skip the water stop right before a big hill. Outside of that, though, they weren't seen very often until after the Steam Age, because when steam locomotives were retired, one of the other things that went along with them was the infrastructure to support them, namely water towers. Why would they keep them around? Diesels didn't use them. So there aren't that many of those left, hardly at all. So for modern steam operation and excursion service, like on Union Pacific with 844 and 4014, they use canteens because they don't have as many water stops. In the modern day, they have to use fire hydrant hookups, which works, but those stops aren't quite as regular or as convenient as the water towers once were. Hence why the canteens are very helpful. But when I started this video, I mentioned how, um, Steam locomotives aren't the only ones to use tenders. There are tenders, known as fuel tenders, that are used with diesels. Now, why would a diesel be using a tender? They don't need water. True, but they do need fuel. Effectively, it's just an auxiliary fuel tank. This improves the diesel's range, and it was actually really economical in very remote territory where getting large amounts of diesel fuel out there was very expensive. Burlington Northern ran into this a lot. What they discovered was that it was cheaper to purchase fuel in areas where it was literally cheaper to buy diesel fuel and then load it 
into a fuel tender. And then they would take the tender to the more remote area and utilize the fuel out there. That was actually more cost effective for them than just buying it out in the remote areas, you know? It wasn't unusual to see a pair of SD40-2s with one of these fuel tenders in between them. And they weren't the only ones that tried this. It's not a common thing, but it is something that railroads have done before. And fuel tenders weren't the only kind of tenders that diesels used. There are also brake tenders, but this is mostly over in Britain. They used those a lot with their early mainline diesel locomotives. They would couple one or two in front or behind the diesel to provide extra braking power because a lot of the dated coaches they were still using weren't fitted with automatic brakes. And the diesels were having trouble stopping these older cars because they, by their nature, were lighter than the older steam locomotives. So British Rail stuck these tenders, which were basically just low, heavy wagons, to help the diesels stop the train until they got more modern cars in the mix and didn't need them anymore. There were also powered tenders. These were weird, really weird. And they didn't really have much longevity or much use overall in terms of railroading history. These tenders basically had their own driving wheels and could help provide additional tractive effort to a locomotive. That's really cool, but um, crews hated these just, just so much. They hated them so, so much with such a violent passion. The reason for this is that the railway men found that they were basically running two locomotives with these powered tenders, and they wanted extra pay. That and the fact that powered tenders required a whole different maintenance ethos and were more expensive to run on their own meant that railways just weren't that keen on them. The locomotives themselves were becoming more powerful too, but the extra tractive effort they gained from the tenders really wasn't worth it in the grand scheme of things. It wasn't cost effective. Although powered tenders did have a lot of success on geared steam locomotives. Shays, Climaxes, and Heislers did utilize this setup because they worked very steep grades and they needed all the tractive effort they could possibly get, which in their case was a lot by default, but powered tenders made it even better. In a sense, you could consider the modern day slugs that are used with diesel electric locomotives a form of the powered tenders. A slug is just another car that has traction motors that draw electricity from the locomotive's prime mover and provide the extra tractive effort, just like the power tenders used to. So, technically speaking, they're the same. Except in their case, the crew doesn't have to do any extra work to deal with them generally, and thus they are more economical as a result. Whew! That was a long list. Though I think I've given you the basic overview when it comes to tenders. They are obviously a very important part of railroad history, particularly steam locomotive history. As for the vast majority of them, they were a very essential piece of the puzzle. The locomotive couldn't go very far without one, and even when you were a kid, doodling a picture of a train in your notebook and you're supposed to be paying attention to your math class, young man or lady, you likely never forgot to draw a tender right behind that locomotive. Unless you were drawing Thomas. He, he, he doesn't have tenders. He's a tank engine. He doesn't, he doesn't need those. And with that, a special thank you that's to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord Off 444, I Surfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Will Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCola, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Hayden DeGro, Metal for Life Guy, No, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mr. Sleepy, DM Travel Typhoon, Harry, Drew Debris, George Kenny, Kevin Wood, Liam Wright, Morris Hillman Productions, NJ1969, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Hannah Bird, Western Colorado History, Ryan Wehofer, Derousey, Your Mom Liked It, Windy City Rails, A Person 723, William Nemo, Dr. Razor 78, Shimasu, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.